Hi there and welcome. Uh, my name is Martin, I'm the Rector of Hesville and whether you're from Hesville or elsewhere, we're delighted that you're joining us for this date night and that you've decided to set aside time to spend in conversation with your own spouse or partner. Hi, I'm Helen. And I'm Andy and it's great for you chosen to join us. Helen and I know how hard it can be to create opportunity to enjoy each other's company or spend quality time together. We hope that these date night experiences will allow us to do just that. My name is Sarah. Um, I don't know how long you've been married, but Martin and I will have been married 20 years this year. And in fact, at my recent birthday, Martin presented me with this book. Uh, this is celebrating 20 years of vicarious life. Uh, every year since we've been married in the year 2000, we've produced a Christmas newsletter which we sent to family and friends. We've called it Vicarious Life. Uh, and so I took all those editions and put them together in a book and then interspersed them with photographs from uh, each of those years. And it just forms a, a written and photographic record of our uh, 20 years of marriage and family life. Quite incredible to see 20 years laid out in that way. One of the other things that Martin and I do every year is to run a marriage preparation day here at St Peter's. It's a great day going over uh, what it is to be married, looking at our married marriage vows uh, with couples who are getting ready to be married. And Martin and I find that really helpful as a couple because it gives us the opportunity to review our own marriage. We like it to uh, be a bit of a marriage MOT and I think our desire for this date night is that it gives you and us an opportunity to run a marriage MOT. I know that in a busy household of six, finding the time to focus on each other can sometimes be impossible. So over the next hour or so, let's enjoy the time we have to invest in and strengthen our relationship. As a couple, we have found these experiences enjoyable, thought provoking, and they've given us a chance to really be honest with each other all while having a great time. We really hope you enjoy this time together. So we'll be offering some resources produced by Care for the Family, a series of videos with some teaching and wisdom about marriage, some vox pox, uh, Christian couples just sharing some of their uh, joys and, and struggles, and some questions which we will engage with ourselves as conversation starters and offer to you. Uh, were we doing this in St Peter's Centre, we would begin with a glass of bubbly and do each of the sections over a three course meal. So the video is in four sections which you can pause when it says so with the different questions or activities to uh, just to get you started if you find them uh, helpful. We will come back to you at intervals uh, just to see how you're getting on and to touch base with you. Um, but just to get us started we have um, a two minute introduction which just sets the theme of this evening. Hi Ben. Hi Jade. Hi Loretta. Take you Emlyn. Take you Lucinda. To be my wife. To be my wife. To be my husband. You say it. You, you're telling me. To have and to hold. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. Definitely poorer. <laughs> in sickness and in health. To love and to... To... Do you know what word? Sorry, I know what word is here. I know the word dismissing. We only did this a few months ago, we should know. <laughs> I'm a church organist. I play for a lot of weddings. To love and to care. To look after. I think it's a bye. No, oh, it's to hold. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> That's ch it's cher It's cherish, isn't it? What's the word? Cherish. To love and to cherish. I think cherish. To love and to cherish. All right. <laughs> I think I got that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Till death is too part. Till death is too part. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> would you have been able to fill in the blank? Yeah, would you have known Cherish? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So it's over to you now, really. Um, we've got a few ideas of conversation starters, but you may have many things that you want to talk about yourselves. But we offer these to you as a, a possibility. You might like to think, what does the word cherish mean to you? Um, this is an interesting one. Um, research has shown that uh, watching five romantic films uh, can have a greater positive influence on a marriage than counselling. So uh, maybe what's your favourite romantic film and why? Love Actually, I think. Uh, does Who Framed Roger Rabbit count as a romantic comedy? <laughs> <laughs> How about recall a date you shared in the early stages of your relationship and why was that particular date special? Great, so we're going to put those up on the screen for you now. Suggest that if you've got a start or just something to begin with, you might uh, spend 10, 15 minutes talking about those together and then we'll see you in a moment. Martin and I were just recalling one of our very early dates um, when we were camping and uh, walking in the Lake District. Uh, Sarah had been to Alaska previously, so she had a, a really good winter sleeping bag, down sleeping bag. I had some tatty old sleeping bag and just spent the night freezing cold. <laughs> it was almost our last date. <laughs> Uh, great. I hope you found those uh, conversation starters good and helpful for you. We're now going to move on and hear from Rob Parsons, who's the Director of Care for the Family, who's got some uh, wisdom and insight just to help us think a little bit more about this whole idea of cherishing one another. To love and to cherish, something many of us say to each other on our wedding day. But of all the vows we say to each other, this is probably one of the easiest to forget. One of the saddest things you'll ever hear is when a couple say, we just drifted apart. There wasn't a single event, a challenge or a problem. They just drifted apart and didn't even see it coming. So we need to value each other. We need to know that our partner matters to us and we matter to them. We need to cherish. One of the most basic needs in human beings is to believe that we matter to somebody. I remember an occasion that happened many years ago. Dan and I had only been married for a couple of years, and one night there's a knock on our door. It's very near Christmas. And when I open it, there's a man standing there. I recognize him. His name is Ronnie. He used to come to our church Sunday school when we were kids. Slightly educationally challenged, no family of his own, spent all his life in a care home, and now he's practically homeless. And in his right hand is a black plastic bag with all his worldly possessions, and his left hand, a frozen chicken. I said, Ronnie, where'd you get your chicken? He said, somebody gave it to me for Christmas. I said, would you know how to cook? He said, no, I can't cook a chicken. I said, come on in, we'll, we'll cook a chicken for you. And he ate with us that night. And I remember Dan saying to him, Ronnie, why don't you stay with us tonight? And he stayed with us the next night. And then Diane said, Ronnie, don't go home now, it's Christmas Eve. Ronnie never left our home. He's been with us almost 40 years. The kids are gone, but Ronnie is still with us. And when he'd been with us for a short time, he got a job as a dustman. I was a lawyer then, and, and on the way to the law practice, I'd drop him off at the dust yard. And so often, when I got home at night, he'd be sat in a chair, smiling, sometimes giggling. And I can remember saying to him, Ron, what amuses you so much? You're always giggling when I get home at night. He said, Rob, when you drop me off at work in the mornings, the other men say to me, who's that brings you to work in the car? And I say, oh, that's my lawyer. <laughs> you know, I thought so much about that. Who'd be proud of being taken to work by a lawyer? Do you know what I think it was? Ronnie never had a mum when he was five years old taking first day of school. Never saw his mother brush away a tear as he went into the playground for the first time. Never had a dad say to him when he was 11, how'd you go in the big school today, son? And now he's a man and somebody is at the gate. Somebody's saying, you matter uh, to me. You know, the belief that we matter is vital in a marriage. And that belief begins to die when we come to believe we're just being taken for granted. I remember somebody saying to me, you know, in my marriage, sometimes I feel as if I'm, I'm just a piece of the furniture. It's a bit like that old song, you don't bring me flowers. You don't sing me love songs. You never talk to me anymore when you come through the door at the end of the day. But it's easy for that to happen in a marriage, isn't it? 
Because sometimes we're consumed with the ordinary, the household chores, the leaking washing machine, if we've got kids taking them to piano lessons, searching for a lost hamster. And those ordinary things sometimes conspire to make the spark that causes us to fall in love seem pretty dim at times. And that's understandable. And it's fascinating how we perceive whether or not we matter to somebody. I remember saying to my wife, Diane, darling, if you could change anything about me, what would it be? I rather hope she would have to think about it for a while. Diane didn't even hesitate. She said, when you shave, you leave the stubble in the sink. You get shaving foam up the wall, I'm not sure how you do it, higher than head height. And you roll the towel up and throw it in a wet bowl in the bath. I would like you to remove the stubble, clear away the shaving foam, fold the towel up and put it over the towel rail. I said, is that it? My darling wife said, that will do for starters. Now, Diane's had a full-time job outside the home and part-time jobs, but just then she was a full-time homemaker. And I can imagine her saying, you know, when, when I look after the house right now, when I clean the place, when I try the picture on that wall instead of that wall, right now, this is my job. And I get a fair chunk of my identity from this job. And you know what, Rob? When you and the kids trash the house and you leave stuff all over the place as though a hurricane has just visited us, what you seem to say to me sometimes is, what I do doesn't matter. Your job is important, but what I do doesn't matter. And Rob, sometimes it makes me feel that I don't matter. Let me give you three simple ways you can let another person know they really do matter to you. Number one, words of appreciation. Thank you for doing that. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you. Secondly, words of praise. You did a terrific job there. You look great tonight. That meal was brilliant. And thirdly, simple acts of kindness. It could be just filling the car with petrol or checking the tires. I think of a friend who's a keen cyclist. He'd often get home on winter nights freezing. He said, one night I got home and my wife had a big fluffy towel warmed up and a bath ready for me. He said, I'm not expecting it every night, but that night it was wonderful. Simple acts of kindness. Sometimes people say to me, oh, I don't need that in my marriage. My husband knows I love him. My wife knows that I love her. That is 100% wrong. The only way we can tell we are loved is by what people say to us and what they do for us. And sometimes we have to say and do those things when we don't feel like doing it. Sometimes perhaps when we don't even feel in love. But words of appreciation, words of praise, acts of kindness are so powerful. They not only change the person who receives them, they sometimes change the person who gives them. And that is because they help answer that most basic question of human beings. Do I matter to somebody? Is there anybody at the gate? Sometimes we can find it hard to show our partner what they mean to us. Maybe we forget, or we don't have the time and the energy, or we just don't want to. Or maybe, more truthfully, we just don't know how to show them what they mean to us. But if we discover this, it can transform our marriages. So Philip, we've been talking about the word cherish. What, is, what does that word cherish mean to you? I think for me, cherish is about the quality uh, of the love that you express with one another. Uh, and I think it, it, it talks about someone that means perhaps more to you than anybody else. My, my daughters, my teenage daughters, they have this expression that they've got into recently, which is uh, my bae. Uh, and I asked them, what, what does that mean? Is that short for baby? Or They said, no, Dad, they said bae, it, it's, um, it's an acrostic, it's B-A-E. It means before anyone else. And cherish, the idea of cherish means that you have that one person and for you, they're before anyone else, they're before everything else. They're the person that you, you most highly prize, the person that you lavish all your uh, love, the best of you, onto. So what do you think prevents us from cherishing each other in our marriages? Well, I think it's just very simply the fact that you grow used to one another. You know, I think cherish is the opposite of take for granted. 
And in any relationship with any couple, no matter how much in love you are, no matter who you are, no matter how hard you try, over time, the danger for all of us and the reality is that you, you begin to take each other for granted. And that, that sense of cherishing and, and being extravagant in, in the way that you show your love can just start to get left by the wayside. But when life is busy, or when you go through those difficult seasons, maybe um, young children, first child, uh, moving, those, those kind of tension points in life, that cherishing is the thing that can get lost the first. Yeah, so we need to be proactive, we need to be actually be intentional about yeah, how I we think, do that. Yeah, I think intentional is, is a really good word. I think actually having the intention that this is something that I'm not just going to do if it comes naturally, but I'm going to make it happen no matter whether I feel like it or not. Yeah. yeah. So why do you think some couples struggle to cherish each other, to show each other that they love each other in their marriages? Well, I think part of it is just it's not always easy and obvious to understand how your partner is going to receive that loving and that cherishing. I mean, for me, I, I used to find it very frustrating early on in our marriage because I would, I would do my best. I honestly thought this is a good thing to do, to cherish my wife, show her love. And so I'd do all these things and then I'd find out that she didn't feel loved. So I would, I'd compose a little poem, I'd put it written down on a piece of card on the uh, windscreen wipers of her car or I'd, I'd make a song up or I'd do these things which I thought were tremendously romantic. And then didn't the next, you like them? Well, uh, she didn't not like them, but we'd, we'd have this kind of row when you don't love me and I'm like, but I wrote you a poem. And it took me ages to work out that she didn't necessarily feel cherished. I mean, she quite, thought it was quite cute, quite nice. Obviously, I'm making an effort. But if I really wanted to cherish her, then there were other ways to do that. Actually, she would want me to do the dishes <laughs> or to mow the lawn or to, you know, tidy my mess up. And actually to find out that those are the things that made her feel cherished was a real revelation for me. But I think it's quite common for couples to feel like they're missing each other in that area. So what advice would you give couples if that was how they felt? Well, I think what you have to do is you've got to work out how the other person receives love. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but this is something which is, it's actually a well-worn path. It, it, it's something that has been, it's come to be known as the love languages, the five love languages, which was developed by a guy called Gary Chapman, who's done an incredible amount of work on relationships and couples counselling. And what he essentially says is that there are roughly five distinct ways that people will perceive love, five love languages. Now, the issue is that we tend to think that the way that we receive love is the way that is the best way to communicate love to our partners. But what you need to understand is that for some people, it's all about words. And I'm a words person. So when people talked about the, the love languages to me, I just thought that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, my love language is English, like the rest of my language. Um, but it's not that way for everybody. For some of us, words, positive words, affirmation, that's absolutely what makes us feel loved. But for other people, like for my wife, it's actually actions. Um, so the words are appreciated, but the actions, that's where they really feel loved. So doing things practically, um, being real about uh, everyday things, you know, serving one another. For other people, actually, it's all about time. You don't have to be doing any great thing, but just the fact that you've got quality time that you're spending together makes the person feel loved. And the other two, well, for some people, it's about touch physical touch. You know, different people have different capacities for touch. For some people, just a little bit of touch, a hand on the shoulder, I'm going to feel great. For others, they need to feel like there's tons of touch and lots of holding, um, and that's the way they perceive love. And then for others, it's just gifts. You know, it's, it's actually a present, and that's the way that they feel loved. So I was with a couple just a, a few weeks ago, my wife and I, we were just talking to them, and, and they had issues around their marriage. And she was saying, well, the thing is, I just don't feel loved. And then he was getting frustrated and he was saying, but she knows that I love her. You know, I, I don't need to keep telling her that. And we had to say, well, actually, you, you sort of do. Because just loving someone in your head, they don't necessarily get the benefit of that. And if you want them to know that they're loved, you have to communicate in the way that they experience that for themselves. And so find out from your partner, what makes you feel loved? How do you feel most loved? You know, what is it that I do that makes you feel loved the most? That is brilliant. So cherishing each other, particularly through those five different ways. So words, time, actions, gifts and touch.
Thank you, Philip. That's brilliant. Thanks. I think um, knowing specifically each other's love languages is um, key really to being able to understand each other and to kind of make sure that you're kind of meeting each other's needs. We definitely got different ones that I would just think, oh, well, we're married, we must be alike, we must have the same ones, but it's definitely not true. If you can home in on what each other's kind of personal kind of preference is, then obviously like that person is going to feel more cared for, loved, appreciated. I am acts of service and quality time, which Matt was used to do with the hardest two to do. We have both two completely different love languages, but now that we know that and feed under that, it's yeah. made a remarkable difference. Yeah. It's because Matt is physical touch and words of affirmation. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I do think every now and again, oh, I'd actually better say something, you know, because I will do lots of you know nice things in the background or whatever it is. But every now and again, I think, well, I must tell Matt he did really well at this or, you know, something positive like that or give him a cuddle or something. We do often forget what those love languages are and we have to constantly keep coming back to them, don't we? And I think that's really useful for both of us. I, I feel he loves me when he remembers and does the bins for me and he checks my tyre pressures for me and things like that. That shows he loves me. I suppose early on in our marriage, you know, the big frustration is when you put all this effort into something and it's not really received in the way that reflects the amount of effort you put in, yeah. you know. So I think where the love language stuff was yeah. really helpful was, you know, realising where to place effort, you know. Yeah. And obviously the like really typical thing of, you know, you typically share love the way you like to receive it, so you put all the effort in stuff that you would actually like and then don't get it when it's not, you yeah. know. So I think that's been really helpful. Yeah. So I've had to like rewire myself in the sense of the stuff that I would usually do, that won't actually have the impact I, I hope it would. So he used to, when we were dating, he used to show up late with a bunch of flowers. I'd be, I'd be so upset he was like half an hour late. And a bunch of flowers could have gone in the bin. I know that sounds rude, but I was so cross he would be so late. So I think as soon as you realise that, it actually it did make a big difference. You got me an Oreo milkshake in, in exchange for 10 minutes of stroke in the back, which I would find really <laughs> irritating. But to Gem, that's one yeah. of her love languages, yeah. isn't it? It worked. In. Yeah. Yeah. Compromise. It's yeah. fine. But it is really cheesy as well. It is. <laughs> Some really good things there, weren't there? Some real nuggets of wisdom to take into our relationships, some thought-provoking things to uh, think about and discuss together now. There'll be a couple of uh, questions coming up on the screen uh, to aid your conversation. Um, firstly, how do you show your partner that they matter? And what else could you do? And this one's a good one, I think. We use the five languages of love in our marriage preparation. It's a really helpful tool to understanding your own needs, the needs of others, how to show love to someone else, how to receive love from someone else. So you might like to just discuss together what do you think your love languages are, your own, uh, your partner's, and how could you use those to strengthen your relationship? I'll uh, put those questions up for you now. If you are sharing a meal, you might like to enjoy the next course together and come back whenever you've uh, had time to uh, eat and discuss them. I know that we found the five languages of love to be really helpful to us uh, and if you're not exactly sure what yours are uh, there's, a, there's a good website just google it and uh, uh, you can find 30 questions I think it is and it will tell you what your primary and secondary love languages are. Um, we're in a position where ours are very similar uh, so for both of us our primary love language will be quality time and so we've learned the importance of spending time together. But that very often isn't easy to do when you've got busy jobs, you've got family commitments. Um, and we have found that over the course of our marriage, uh, finding those times has had to change. It can be something very simple like sharing, cooking a meal together in the kitchen. Sometimes we're going for a walk together. Um, sometimes it's really unromantic. It involves putting it in the diary and just spending an evening talking together. And the other thing we found as well is that as our children have grown up, then we have less time in the evenings together. So mm. having to find time at other other times of the day uh, is really important. But also spending time as a family with the children too and kind of modelling that uh, importance of quality time for them as well. So hopefully you found it helpful just identifying what your love languages are and how you can receive and show love to one another. 
We're going to carry on now with Rob Parsons. We're going to pick up with some other words of wisdom that he has to offer us. Uh, so hope that you enjoy listening to this. Uh, and then at the end of that, there'll be some more questions to talk about if you've got your dessert still to come uh, over that. To cherish means to uh, surround the person with uh, love, uh, with appreciation, with care. To support one another whenever that's necessary. Look after. Respect. Uh, take care of. To value that person, I think, more than anything else. Being happy. Being. Okay, that's a very, very profound word. You can feel it. It's love and passion and a sort of deeply caring. To cherish someone is to be aware of all their faults. More patient to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and to love them even so they've got a lot of faults. <laughs> the most important thing is to be friends. It's not just to love, but, but to enjoy each other's company. We do a lot together. Yeah, we do. We travel a lot. We do have most things together. Yeah. yeah. Sort of revere them a little bit. To think about what matters to the other one and try and do that. Put the other one first. You put them before yourself and um, you look out for them, take care of them and protect them. Oh. <laughs> so we can all get better at showing our partners that we love them but we have to want to. A loving relationship doesn't just happen by accident. We have to be intentional. We have to work at it. It is so important to speak positively about each other and build each other up and encourage um, each other because that's what we naturally do sometimes to other people, but sometimes it's harder to remember to do it to each other. Mm. Obviously you being from America and me being from here and some of the cultural, <laughs> you know, like, you know, just typically Americans are much more comfortable with even Part, just being yeah. positive in I'm general. I'm like, yay, you, you washed know. the dishes, well done. <laughs> Not patronizing at all. When the kids have come along, we just realize actually they, they see and pick up on, on what we say to each other. So um, we're always trying to sort of speak well of each other, particularly when they're around. So we have, <laughs> uh, we have three children, three and under. And so I think speaking positively to each other is something that we find ourselves reminding each other of often. Yes, be for us and because the children are listening. <laughs> we'll only speak well of each other sort of when we're in other people's company. If we do have an issue with each other, then we'll try and sort of communicate that, but do it in a place where there's not other people around and about, so we're not sort of airing our, our dirty washing in front of everyone, because I've sort of seen that done, and I know it can be, it can be quite quite painful at times. Yeah. If there's something negative that needs to be said, you know, we'd be doing it in a, in a good way. Yeah. Right now we're in the young family stage, mm. things are crazy, you're just tired all the time. And so it's so easy just to be bickering and picking. To be careful how you say the negative. Yes, I think we've how learned you say that it. over the years, you know. Yeah. Philip and I are both very confident people and self-confident. But it's still so important that you hear positive words from the person who you love. Dave is brilliant at it. He's very, you are, you're very Thanks. affirming. He's really affirming and he's very good at um, being really genuine with it as well. You know it's honest, you know it's true and because it's somebody who you value, you value those words so much more. Did you have a best friend at school? Uh, I'm sure you did. Marriage and friendship are different, and yet great marriages and great friendships have something in common. Those involved give each other time. And you know, when we look at the factors that destroy marriages, destroy family life, time and time again, people mention time pressure. I I've made some bad mistakes in that area in my own life. I remember many years ago when the children were small and I would be very late coming home from the legal practice. It would be time for our evening meal, but the, my meal would be cold. And Dan had long since given up trying to talk to me. But sometimes as we sat around that table, two small children would still be trying. 
A little girl would be saying, Daddy, Susan, pull my hair again. A little boy would say, Daddy, I I'm in the football team on Saturday. But I'd be on another planet, comatose. I'd made 100 phone calls that day, had 50 planned to make that night, and I would just sit there until the telephone rang. And the little boy would say, Daddy, it's for you. And suddenly I'd come alive. And I remember one evening putting the kids to bed and Diane saying to me, Rob, I, I'm not sure I can go on like this very much longer. I, I don't think I can cope anymore. You seem to become an increasingly distant from us. You, you don't seem to want to give us any, any time. Do you know what kept me in that lifestyle far longer than it should have? I used to say to myself, a slower day's coming. Life won't always be this busy. You know, when the other office is set up and when the computers are working and when we've done this, we're going to have more time. But that is a total illusion. The slower day never does come. And actually, if anything matters to us, we have to give it time today. And it dawned on me when Diane said that to me, that, that unless I change, the most precious things in my life were going to slip through my fingers. And I did begin uh, to change. Now, the battle against time pressure is a long-haul one, and certainly for Diane and I, over the years, we've tried various strategies. But let me share three with you that have worked uh, for us. They're all peace. Number one, prioritize time together. It's good to do things together. We're in a room together. Now, it doesn't mean we're doing exactly the same things. How's your clay pot coming along? Mine's, mine's doing fine. But it does mean there's a sense of togetherness. Do you know, when we're watching television together, perhaps a drama, it really annoys Diane if she sees me sneakily looking at text messages on my mobile phone. She'll say, Rob, let's watch this together. And it can be in the ordinary things of life, shopping, going to parent-teach evenings, but we do it together. Secondly, plan time together. Now, do you know, this is very important. I remember Diane doing this. We, we, we ruled out every Thursday evening to spend time together. In fact, I think of some friends of ours who were about to have a divorce, and they decided to have one last effort to save their marriage. They ruled out every Tuesday evening. No point ringing them on that night. Their mobiles were off. This was them fighting to keep their marriage alive, and they were planning it. And thirdly, protected time. You know, the second week we say we're going to have that Tuesday night together, that Thursday night together, it's as if everybody comes to, to rob us of that, but it's worth defending it. Practically with our lives, we're fighting to keep our relationship together. And you know, it is worth defending, especially when we see the price of not having that time together. Do you know, I honestly believe that our marriages of 25 years plus, and in all that time, they have had 25 minutes where they've sat in a quiet room and listened to each other. Darling, tell me your hopes, tell me your fears, tell me your dreams. Tell me what about me drives you crazy. Can I share one or two things about you that bother me? <laughs> Not 25 minutes in 25 years, and it tears the heart out of love. Three simple strategies, three Ps. Prioritize time together, plan time together, protect time together. Time's a fascinating thing, isn't it? You can't buy it, you can't mortgage it, you can't rent it, you can't save it. People say to me, I saved an hour. Really? Where did you put it? Did you put it under the bed? You can save money, but you can only spend time. And everybody wants more time, but everybody has all the time there is. And you know, at the end of our lives, as we look back and think how we've spent that most precious commodity of time, We'll want to know we've invested it well. And for most of us, that will mean in mainly relationships. Somebody once said, nobody ever said on their deathbed, wow, I, I wish I spent more time at the office. It's said that children spell love T-I-M-E, but they're not the only ones. You are my husband. You are my wife. We spend time together. You're my best friend. Best what is date? the best date that we've been on together? It's going to sound really cliche, um, but I think the best date was probably the first, first date. <laughs> Most memorable for me was probably one of the first ones, Piccolino's. Mm -hmm. But yeah. only because it cost so much. Taking you in climbing one time, that was fun. For who? <laughs> I almost died, basically. <laughs> was that why that was fun? 
I think for me it was probably going to Twickenham. Yeah. It was quite a laugh, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't know who was Not too much in. awkward conversation, because you could just watch the rugby. Yeah. For my 30th, Paul had organised it, took me to Paris for three days. Um, and yeah, it was wonderful. But I think my favourite date was the day we went to Dublin Zoo and we spent the day with the animals and each other, obviously. obviously. Glad, you, glad you got to that, yeah. <laughs> that time we went to Murloc Bay. Do you remember we went to Murloc Bay? That was a great date. With the kids, like two weeks ago? No, when we went and then we walked in the bluebells and then we had to climb over the fence. Oh yeah, that was after the boys were born mm -hmm. and we got babysitters. If we can go away somewhere where we get good food and um, child free, that's yeah. always a good date. Yeah. It can be a lunch or it can be a weekend, Yeah. whatever. We, we really love quality time and time spent together, so whatever we're doing, if it's together, we're in our element. Can't think of anything. Can you? <laughs> Every date's special. Yeah. yeah, we don't have many of them for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, there's so many of those couples mentioned spending time together. It's so, so important. So uh, thank you for setting aside this time yourselves uh, to invest in each other. Just to think a little bit more about what the couples and what Rob Parson was saying on the video, there's a couple of questions on the screen for you to continue talking about. I wonder what could you change to ensure that you spend more time together? And the second question that Care for the Family offer us is uh, what three character traits do you love most in your partner? And it suggests trying to think of things that about them as a person rather than things that they do. What are their character traits that you really value and appreciate? So if you are doing this over a meal, you should have got to dessert by now. So as you share your dessert, these uh, two questions will be on the screen for you. I hope you found some of that helpful. Our final short piece of video is an interview with Nikki and Silla Lee who wrote the marriage book. Martin and I were given five copies of this book when we got married. Our friends were clearly worried about us. So I hope it gives you some further insights. And if we were doing this in St Peter's Centre, as the final time discussion, we'd have this little card, action card on the table for you and just suggest at the end of your conversation you begin writing down some of the things that you might take away from your um, discussion, your thoughts, uh, just so that you can put them into action, put them into practice uh, in the weeks and months ahead. And writing it down does help in that in a couple of weeks' time, can we encourage you just to revisit those things that you've written down and think a little bit further about what actions you can take. So here are Nikki and Silla Lee. Yeah. Of course, it's much harder to cherish someone we don't actually like. At the heart of a great marriage is something we can often take for granted, friendship. A great friendship really can make all the difference. So Nikki and Silla, we've been exploring the theme cherish. You've been married for 39 years and for much of that time you've been working with couples. What do you think it takes to build a relationship, to keep love alive over the long haul? Well, I'd say the most important thing is not taking each other for granted. That is, it, it's so easy in a long relationship. You think you know what the other person is feeling, what they're thinking, what's important to them. But actually the reality is we have to go on discovering. We have to go on finding out what is important now, what are the particular pressures on them now so that we can continue to support them, to, to cherish them. And, and also I think that part of taking our marriage for granted means we allow pressures, um, things that are you know, going on in our lives, whether it's work, children, um, other pressures, um, to, to take over and we don't prioritise our relationship and actually being intentional in prioritising our relationship and keeping investing in it is so critical. I remember uh, a few years ago, Scylla's father was very unwell and, and subsequently died. And it was a really important time for me to find out what it was that this meant for Scylla and talking about the time that she would spend uh, with her parents so that she had enough time, wouldn't be left with regrets when her father did that. And, and it was that support um, 
that I knew Nikki was not resentful of me making that time to be with my father just was the complete difference to us staying connected rather than feeling resentful and allowing misunderstandings to build up. And it went on for a period of about four or five months. And it just was an incredible thing to know his understanding and support in that. Of course, that was a very particular, very big pressure. Um, but actually, every day, I think it's about thinking about the other one and their needs before oneself. And it can be such a small thing that makes a massive difference. And one of the things that Nikki, and I think it's around kindness even. And Nikki does something for me every day that I just never cease to am be amazed about. He brings me a cup of tea <laughs> every it's morning. It's not a huge thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you see, I really right. hate the mornings. I'm not a morning person. And it just makes so much difference to me that he brings me a cup of tea. And he's done it for 39 years. And I think, oh my gosh, he's done it again this morning. But it makes me realize he's thinking about me. He's not, you know, he, he's, I just know that I feel valued as a result of that cup of tea. I, I, I remember some years ago, we were going through a big change. Well, I was going through a big change in my work, in, in what I was doing. And I, I needed Scylla's support. And actually, the support I needed was just to be able to process the change with Scylla. She couldn't, she, I, I didn't really need, I don't think I needed advice, although she said a lot of helpful things. I just needed to know that she was with me in this. And, and that process at that particular time, talking it through, her, her listening to, to how it felt for me, was, I, I, I can still feel the difference that made of knowing that we were doing this doing this together and i i think that's a continual process we have to keep doing that this is the talking and the listening this is the stuff of a long marriage that keeps our love alive and in marriage we often talk about marriage being friendship and you clearly have got a brilliant friendship so how have you maintained that friendship over the years I think one of the important things is being intentional about it. Just actually, just like any friendship, we have to make sure that we spend time together. And I suppose for us particularly, doing things together that we both enjoy. This gives us this rich store of shared experiences. Shared experiences lead to shared memories, things that we keep looking back on, that we can enjoy at doing and then talking about together. I think one of the, the keys about friendship is um, this talking. And for us, it's often around meals. We have spent a lot of our marriage eating meals together. <laughs> and actually, when you think about friends, that's what you like to do with yeah. friends. And it, it's during that time that you really um, build the relationship. So, I, I mean, I know for us, there have been moments when we've been tempted not to have, you know, dinner together every evening, just watch the telly, whatever. But actually to say, no, we're gonna find out more about each other and where each other's at and build that friendship, sitting around a table together, being intentional like that. I, I remember a lovely quote I heard some time ago, which was, a friend is someone who is glad to see you and doesn't have any immediate plans for your improvement. <laughs> I thought, that is what friendship is, being with someone who actually just enjoys spending time with you. And, and this is so important, right at the heart of a marriage, being for each other and with each other. Each other's number one fan, I think, is the way I would say. He's my best friend, I'm his number one fan. That is a lovely phrase, actually, isn't it? So putting the other one first, looking out for them, being proactive, that's the heart of friendship, which is part of, of how we cherish each other. But of course, in marriage, we are more than friends, um, we're lovers as well. And uh, how do you think our sexual relationship uh, plays a part in how we can cherish each other? It's a very important part because just as our physical relationship affects every other part of our marriage, every other part of our marriage affects our physical, our sexual relationship. Said that, I think there are, for almost every couple, and certainly in the experience of us talking with many, many couples over the years, and in our own experience, uh, our sexual relationship will go through difficult times as well as good times. And I would want to say that the most important thing is not to give up, that in the difficult times, it may seem like it's all over, it's done. I mean, 
you know, and then people just give up on their sexual relationship and then you lose such a vital part of the intimacy and the closeness and the cherishing, literally, because it is a cherishing. Um, it's the ultimate body language. And for us, there was a difficult time in our own sexual relationship in the midst of having children. <laughs> there was a time for, for Scylla where I think you say mm. there was sort of loss of mm. sexual desire. Yeah, and I remember during that thinking, I don't think I'm ever going to have another passionate <laughs> feeling in my body ever again, simply through hormones, mm. tiredness, and the whole thing of having children. And it was, it was actually amazing to, to be understood by Nikki. And I did a lot of crying, a lot of talking at particular moments. He listened and we worked through it together and realized it was going to be hanging in there and nurturing and he cherished me, I would say, through that tough time. And, um, and you know, things have totally, well, totally changed. I mean, probably um, about two years after the birth of our last child, things started to get better. And uh, I'd have to say our sexual relationship has got better and better um, through that not letting something that seems like a big thing at the time um, stop it. So out of all the things we've talked about, so Scylla, if there was one thing uh, that you could say to couples as to how to cherish each other, what would it be? Study your husband or wife and become an expert in what is it that they need in order to feel loved, to feel valued, to feel special. And, and of course, circumstances change. We change as we grow older. And so we need to keep examining that, keep studying them, and, and actually finding out what is it that makes them flourish, what builds their self-esteem, their confidence. And actually, of course, when, when that happens in a marriage, the marriage flourishes as you seek to make the other one flourish. So it's, my tip would be study your husband or wife. Become the expert, yeah. that is brilliant. And then Nikki, what would you say, one thing? I think I'd choose a little phrase I've heard read at many weddings, and it's clothe yourself with kindness. And kindness means thinking about the other person, putting yourself out to meet their needs. And it, and it may be something as little as making them a cup of tea in the morning, but this can make, these little things can make a big difference in a marriage. And I think today, so often with our very busy, very pressurised lives, the instinctive question is, why isn't he or she helping me? But if we can turn that around and ask our husband or wife, is there something I can do for you today? or now, that can make a huge difference in a marriage. That is so encouraging, wonderful. Nikki and Scylla, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you. Katrin. That's quite a powerful thought to finish with, that, that marriage is not about what you get out of it, but it's actually what you give to it. I love that thought of being friends, being for someone, being with someone. And clothing yourself with kindness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you. I hope you have found this really helpful in your conversation with each other. Um, if anything has come up that you want to get in touch with us, then please do. If nothing else, we'd just love to know that you have done this together. And don't forget the um, action card. would really encourage you to write a few things down that you're going to take away from your time together and then come back to it in a week or two's time just to keep yourself accountable as to how you're getting on in the things you said you would do. So we really hope that you've enjoyed yourself as much as we have. It's a wonderful thing when we truly cherish each other and put love in the centre of our marriages. And as we move forward, I pray we will draw our inspiration and strength from the example of love that God has given us. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've shared together. I pray that we will continue to cherish our partners and grow in our love for one another. I pray you will bless every home that is watching and that you will help our marriages demonstrate the example of love that you have shown us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, we have two further date nights planned where um, we are going to look at different areas of relationships and we'll let you know when these are. 
Um, but for now, we'd love to hear what you thought about this time that we shared together. So please visit our Heswell Parish Facebook page and comment on there, or just comment below on this video. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Mm -hmm.